This is episode 99 of the Death to Tyrants podcast. The crushing weight of the tyrant's passage had left nothing unmarked. You can't split in fucking half, but I call him the hologram graph. But I am the center inside the placenta of math. You clash with cyanide gas and die fast. Rhythmically equivalent of solids, liquid and gas. We smash a science with the power of Lord Titus. But I am the virus inside of the iris of Cyrus. What's up, you guys? Welcome back once again to the Death to Tyrants podcast. As always, I am your host and humble narrator, Buck Johnson, coming to you out of Austin, Texas, where uh, basically it's probably pretty much like the places you guys live in. We're all kind of in the same spot right now as far as activities go for the most part. Uh, This is another episode in the series I will be releasing discussing every aspect of the coronavirus COVID-19 wild moment that we're living through that, uh, that I can. So one of the things I've been thinking about is, especially after this stimulus bill passed, we can't afford certain things anymore. I mean, we really couldn't afford to pass that bill, but uh, they did it anyway. And one of those things that's going to have to change, you know, like so many things because of this whole incident, basically, is that uh, you can't have troops all across the world fighting endless wars. Now, maybe this is a silver lining. I guess it would be of, of the COVID-19 stuff but we're going to have to bring them home. Uh, We can't afford this anymore. We couldn't really afford it before. Now, we certainly can't afford it. And uh, along with many, many other things. Well, anytime I want to discuss foreign policy, I get uh, what Dave Smith likes to call the most important voice on the most important topic. And that is Scott Horton. And uh, that's who's here with us today. It's, It's funny. Uh, we get into the foreign policy, of course, and uh, basically that these wars have to end. And Scott, as you guys know, is is so well versed on that topic that uh, basically he could win any debate he wanted to. We also start talking about other stuff. The conversation kind of takes some fun turns, and Scott's one of those guys. It's like I feel like I could throw any topic at him, and he can just rattle stuff off off the top of his head. And it's amazing. He he can do that really like no other. So we get into, Scott is a very passionate uh, soliloquy, we'll call it at the end, towards the end of this episode. And it's basically the capitalism in the form that we know it in the United States has failed. And there's a problem with referring to what we as libertarians, uh, the free market world, Maybe there's a problem referring to that world as capitalist, because when normies on the street think of capitalism, well, they're going to say, well, that's what the United States has. And really, by any objective measure, you're going to say, well, that system's not very good because it's not right. Now, obviously, most of you guys listening to this are libertarians, I assume, and you know that it's crony, excuse me, as uh, is it uh, Gene Epstein calls it capitalism, crony capitalism is not free market by any means. And and so we know that, and we know that the free market is the answer to the mess that we're in now. But if you think of some normal person on the street, they're going to look at it and say, well, if the opposite of what we have is socialism, then I guess socialism might be okay. So anyway, there's obviously a lot of problems with that mindset. And, and Scott has a very passionate uh, plea kind of to let's rephrase certain things And uh, it's our jobs as libertarians to show that this COVID-19 thing is not a failure of the free market at all. It's a failure basically of government at every level. And so we get into that as well. I think you guys will dig this conversation. For those of you who don't know who Scott is, uh, what the hell's the matter with you? Let me tell you about him real quick. He's the director over at the Libertarian Institute. He's editorial director of antiwar.com. He's the host of the Scott Horton Show and Antiwar Radio. He's done more than 5,000 interviews since 2003. And here I am. I think this is episode 99. It's a big deal. Scott's done over 5,000 interviews. It's crazy. He's author of the 2017 book, Fool's Aaron, Time to End the War in Afghanistan. And he's editor of the 2019 book, The Great Ron Paul, the Scott Horton Show interviews from 2004 to 2019. I will waste your time no longer. Let's get him on. Scott, welcome to the show, man. How are you? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm doing damn good myself. That's slightly hungover, but 
That's what happens when you're pent up inside during this weird time in our history here. I wanted to talk to you. You put out a great article and basically saying, we've got to end these wars now. Something I had been thinking about during this weird thing is Ron Paul used to say, and probably still says, we are going to bring all of the troops home. It might not be in body bags, hopefully, but it's going to be because we can't afford to keep them all over the world anymore. At some point, the bill's coming and we can't afford to pay it. And it seems to me like that time might be here because with the stimulus stuff and a lot of stuff, in my opinion, the ship has sailed on Medicare for all. That's done. You can't afford it anymore. We couldn't afford it to begin with. And I'm thinking keeping the troops all over the world in wars that are pointless and do only bad things at this point is done as well. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I'll, um, I'll disagree slightly. I think that what's going to end up happening is that we're going to abandon the empire. We should abandon the empire. And I think we'll do it so that they can pass some sort of Medicare for all. Because in the current situation, of course, you have 10 million people filing for unemployment in a month's time. And even if the sun comes and burns this virus off and the whole problem goes away quickly, which I don't know how likely that is, but even if that were to happen, we were already in a massive bubble that was due to crash anyway. We were going to have a great recession anyway. And then now with this clampdown and the level of just the screeching halt that the economy has been brought to, I don't think anybody knows what it's going to look like as to try to to get things put back together again, how long it's going to take for people to go to work. All of those marginal businesses that went bankrupt, are they going to stand a chance of opening back up again and this kind of thing? And so people, you know, we already had, as Bernie Sanders points out all the time, almost 40 million Americans had no health insurance anyway. And that was with the Obamacare subsidies and all of that. And um, now that number is going to be so much higher in fact, I saw a clip of Donald Trump saying, really, 40 million people don't have health insurance. Well, that doesn't sound right, you know, because he doesn't know anything about anything. But then and now that number is going to be 50 million, 60 million, 70 million. What's supposed to happen to these people? Um, and so I think what we're facing probably is going to look like a lot what happened to England uh, after World War II, where they fired Churchill and the war party. And they brought in the Labor Party who would make sure to shore up the welfare state. And by 49, they'd even left India. They abandoned their entire empire, which was a financially losing proposition. And um, in order that they could have, number one, their NHS, the socialized healthcare system that they have there, which has its problems. I'm not endorsing that. I'm being descriptive, not normative here. Obviously, I think that the only solution to every economic problem is complete laissez-faire free market competition where the consumer is the king instead of the suppliers. But um, just in this current situation, I think that's what's going to end up happening is that people are going to demand, are going to demand some form of um, single payer, which frankly, it doesn't mean that every hospital uh, is nationalized. It doesn't mean that every doctor becomes a cop. It just means that the government is the one is is the third payer instead of your insurance company being the third payer there. Um, and so you could have much of the system continue as before, only with more people covered. But I think that you know the real problem that we have is we don't have anyone in public life who's really running on that choice, right? Bernie Sanders doesn't have the courage to criticize the empire. And he doesn't have the he doesn't have the courage to take on uh, Joe Biden, who's cleaning his clock. Right. And when his entire career is the reason that Donald Trump is the president right now, every single one of Joe Biden's greatest accomplishments were the policies that the American people elected Donald Trump to repudiate. And Sanders doesn't, and the Democrats overall, they don't have the courage or the gumption or the intellect to figure out that Biden is a sure loser and that if anybody stands a chance, it would be Sanders himself. And Sanders doesn't even have the courage to do what it would take to destroy Biden now so that he can win because he's afraid that he'll get blamed for Biden's loss in the fall if he runs too hard against him. The same math that he used to fail in 2016. 
and Hillary Clinton lost anyway. And so um, there's no one really running to offer that choice. If anything, you know, I saw a tweet yesterday. I think this is actually a possibility that what Trump, if he's smart, what Trump will do is he'll pass Medicare for all and he'll call it Trump care and shove it down the throats of all the center left Democrats who refuse to do it. And because he's an ideology less type, he doesn't care. You know, he's perfectly happy to take all sides of any issue at any given time and flip flop back and forth around. And after all, this is essentially an unprecedented emergency in terms of um, the economic devastation and then the way that all health insurance is tied to people's employment in this country right now. And in the midst of a pandemic, people are being thrown off of the uh, insurance rolls by the millions, by the tens of millions. Uh, so far, already 10. And it'll be 20 in I don't know how long, another few weeks. And so... Um, you know, and and then, but uh, to the point, the real point about we just can't afford the empire anymore. I think that that is just absolutely inescapable. Medicare for all or not, just looking at the current crisis, not enough masks, not enough ventilators, not enough plastic gowns, not enough hospital beds. And we spent 20 years killing Iraqis for what now? Mm hmm. Iraq War two and three, and now we're still fighting Iraq War three and a half over there and threatening to turn the whole war around against the very Shia that we fought Iraq War two and Iraq War three, four, and that could lead to a war with Iran. And I think you put that to any American and they're just going to say, man, I can think of where we might have spent those six trillion dollars instead, you know, patrolling the Helmand province. Where's that? Why we have Marines in the Helmand province when the dollars that it takes to keep them there could be spent on hospital beds here at home. And that's not commie talk. I mean, that's what Ike Eisenhower said in his famous uh, Cross of Iron speech, that every battleship represents a school and a hospital not built, mm -hmm. a sick person not treated. And, you know, you could be a completely free market guy. And that's not saying that government has to run the school or government has to build the hospital bed, um, you know, or anything like that is just saying that's all capital that our government confiscated from us and absolutely wasted on this project. And what do we get out of the Iraq war? Nothing. You know, our government put their enemies, the Iranians, best friends in power in Baghdad. And then they, at the same time, empowered our enemies, Al Qaeda, our government strategic allies, um, but who are, you know, who, who are soaked in the blood of innocent American civilians and others. Um, and, you know, they ended up taking the entire Western half of the country for three years uh, in the Islam, in the form of the Islamic state, which was just Al Qaeda in Iraq in government form. And then we had to fight a whole Iraq war three just to undo that. And and what influence do we have in Iraq now? Well, we're embedded with the Shiite militias who our government claims are attacking our guys. And we're embedded with them fighting with them against what's left of the Islamic State that our government created in the first place. And and now they're threatening to turn against our allies and fight against the very same guys we put in power, which, by the way, if they do that, we're going to lose. We've got only 6,000 guys in Iraq. If they want to take on the Shia, they're going to be dead like the Jedi in Order 66. <laughs> they're embedded with their enemies, fighting against our enemies, the actual bin Ladenites, who would seek to do us harm. So it makes absolutely no sense, no sense whatsoever, that we should be spending money to occupy the Middle East. In Syria, still our position is to protect the al-Qaeda fighters. Mm -hmm. Again, the American people's enemies. Why? Because the Assad government is allies with Iran, our government's enemies or adversaries, not that they mean even our government any harm. And also in Yemen. Our war in Yemen is not the war on terrorism, the war against al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. We abandoned that back in January, or pardon me, five years ago in March of 2015. When Obama had been backing the Shia against them, he turned right around and stabbed them in the back and took al-Qaeda's side. And the Saudis and the UAE and the United States of America have been allied with al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, 
fighting against their enemies, the Houthis, uh, the Houthi Shia regime that took over the capital at the end of 2014. And so these wars, they're not just, you know, not productive. They are treasonous. Mm -hmm. They are absolutely counterproductive and deliberately so. I mean, in the case of the Syria war, Obama and John Brennan, they deliberately backed Al Qaeda for five years until it blew up. Well, for four years until it blew up in the form of the Islamic State. Then they attacked the Islamic State, but they're still back in the Al Qaeda guys. You know, ISIS had split off from Al Qaeda's authority, but they're not really different in any other substantive way. And so these wars aren't just counterproductive, they're absolutely treasonous on behalf of our enemies. And even when they're trying to spite the Iranians, they only end up empowering them more anyway. Iran has more power and influence in Iraq than ever before, more than before we created the Islamic State. And they have more power and influence in Syria than ever before. That's why our government wanted to get rid of Assad because he was friends with Iran. Well, now he's dependent on Iran and their friends in Hezbollah to help keep the Al-Qaeda guys away. And, you know, part of the reason the supposed excuse for going to war on behalf of Al-Qaeda in Yemen was because the Houthis are backed by Iran. But that wasn't really true. They're just kind of friends. And, you know, maybe the Iranians had sent them some money or something. But there's essentially no reason to believe that the Iranians were giving them any real substantial support. But now they are. And I don't know how substantial it is, but they're giving them more support than ever before. It was only late last year or maybe it was last summer in the summer of 2019 before the Ayatollah even recognized the Houthis as the legitimate government of the state of Yemen. And, you know, they they did a drone strike that was supposedly to kill a member of the Iranian Quds Force on the ground there in Yemen. So the fact that of Iran's actual backing of the Houthis is a late invention in this five-year-long war. They have more power and influence there than ever before. And whose fault is that? The USA's. And now in Afghanistan, it's total chaos. I'm not going to say that Iran... Well, if anything, we've empowered Iran there because we've been backing their friends um, in the uh, predominantly in the Ghazni province, uh, you know, the Shiites uh, that live in um, the Hazaras, who are the Shiites who live in Afghanistan, who are allied with Iran. I don't know if that's given them that much more influence there, but marginally. And there is no Al Qaeda in Afghanistan to speak of. So don't worry about that. But the whole war there still has been just a couple of trillion dollars thrown in a black hole where the American people can't get to it. And so at a big round number like 2020, when we're just a solid generation into the terror war, it ought to be obvious to every mom and every dad and every brother and every sister around every kitchen table in this country that, man, we didn't have to do that. We should not have done that. Every single one of those lives was wasted for no good reason. Every single one of those dollars was wasted for no good reason. And just think of the counterfactual. You don't have to be a brilliant genius to just see where might that money have gone instead? Where might America's reputation in the world be if we hadn't listened to Bill Crystal and Richard Pearl and Dick Cheney and George W. Bush? And for that matter, all the Democrats of the Obama group, too, who lied us into this terror war. We have... You know, less dead old people this week. I can tell you that. There is a article I read recently that the intelligence agencies are, some of them are claiming that they warned Trump about this Corona stuff and he didn't listen to them. And a part of the issue of why everything's so backed up or coming to a head at this point, we didn't start soon enough. I say we, I mean the government, the federal government didn't start uh, attacking this soon enough. Do you think the fact that maybe if that's true and him not listening to his quote unquote intelligence agencies is a side effect of the Russiagate hoax? I very well could be. I mean, I don't know exactly what the CIA told him and when, but I decided very early on about this disease that I'm just reading the Wall Street Journal. The Post and the Times will just lie to your face all damn day. The Wall Street Journal tends to respect their audience a little a little bit higher. Now, Michael Gordon should be pushed off of something tall, but <laughs> the rest of the hard news side of the Wall Street Journal tend to do a decent job. And, um, and they respect their audience. They're writing to the business community, the corporate chieftains and the property owners and the real country club Republicans in charge of this place. 
And they were telling their audience all along, hey, this is a big deal. The key is you can spread it without even knowing you're sick. That was not the case with SARS or the bird flu, the H1N1 and, and these things. You had to have a fever to spread it. And so that means it was difficult, but not impossible to lock the thing down. But with this, people are going around spreading it and they have no idea they have it. And that means it's coming here. It's coming everywhere. And businessmen of America, get your act together. They were saying that all through January and February. And anybody who was reading the journal, which, you know what, you might expect for the president of the United States to read the Wall Street Journal, but not this one. And, you know, George W. Bush certainly didn't either. Um, I don't want to give any credit to Obama, but I think he at least read the damn paper. Um, but Trump just has no interest in that. He is interested only in himself. And so um, he looks at everything and he explains everything. You know, there's no secret to this. You listen, every word out of his mouth is about what all of this means about him and what people think of him. And we want to keep these numbers, these numbers low because we have an election coming up. And this kind of thing, he just makes it perfectly clear, which, I mean, how bad of a narcissist do you have to be to not even be able to consider that it's in your interest to look like a brave, heroic leader here right now? The election isn't till November, dummy. You're not going to be able to fudge the numbers lower till November. So why not for your own selfish, personal, narcissistic self-interest, go ahead and get out in front of this parade? And it's taken him even until now. I mean, he was talking just last week. Oh, yeah, sure. I mean, this is almost unbelievable. But go look at his Twitter feed. Oh, yeah, the lamestream media yeah. just wants to hurt the economy to hurt me and my election chances. And that's why they don't want us to reopen the whole country by the middle of April. But that's just not right. And where is his head at? That that's what he thinks. The lamestream media and their vendetta against him aside, why is this so difficult for him to parse these things? And then just as a, a matter of a lack of leadership here, if he had cared about it and had been paying attention, maybe he would have understood much earlier that the CDC and the FDA are the single biggest obstacles to the American people being kept safe from this disease. Yeah. The CDC and the FDA were working together to prevent anyone from testing anything. And maybe that was partly because of political pressure. The president's not trying to hear high numbers right now, guys. Like what? Because he's in a primary against Bill Weld in like one state or two or something. What does he care? Why would he be, you know, but that was what they heard. The president doesn't like high numbers. He likes low numbers. I don't know if that really had an effect or not, or if this is just the internal um, bureaucratic politics and, and economics of these divisions, but it took a lady to risk losing her job. I don't know if she did or not, but this doctor in Washington state yeah. who finally went and spilled her guts to the New York times and ran this story that we were in the middle of a giant study of flu cases in Washington state. And we had samples of every single flu case coming into any hospital in the entire state. And so once we found out about the COVID thing, we wanted to go back and start testing the samples we already had to find out how many people had it, how many of them died, what's the damn deal. And the CDC and the FDA wouldn't let them and like was threatening them with arrest and whatever, you know, laws over turf. Right. And she finally went and, and ratted on them to the New York Times. And it was only then that they allowed her to finally start doing the tests. You know, we've had the Surgeon General has spent months telling people, don't wear a mask. You don't know how to wear a mask. And if you wear a mask, all you're going to do is you're going to get yourself even sicker because masks are bad. What? That's just not true. And why are you lying? And of course, they're lying because they're trying to manage the shortage. They don't have enough masks. And of course, why don't they have enough masks? Because the FDA won't let you make masks. Mm -hmm. The FDA makes it so difficult to make masks and bring them to market that then business can't supply to fix the problem. So then what do they do? They lie to you because they say, no, masks don't work at all. That's why all the healthcare professionals need them. They work real well for them, but not for you. Huh? 
When the honest answer would have been, listen, please, for the love of God, don't hoard more masks than you need. You're all staying home anyway, okay? Keep as many as you really need to get you through a couple of months. And then please donate the rest to the hospital. Americans are good and decent, generous people. They would do that. Mostly. They would do that. And then they could explain. And by the way, who's at the hospital with COVID? People who got coughed on by somebody not wearing a mask. Yeah. People who were touching their face right next to their mouth and nose because they weren't wearing a mask. And so who's who are the healthcare professionals getting sick from? All their sick patients who are sick because they weren't wearing masks because the government was saying not to. And just if Trump, you know, picture not Hillary Clinton, that's a bad example. Picture just some random decent man in his same position, yourself or your buddy in his job. And they come to you and go, look, this is a global pandemic, man. It's got a RO factor of this and a death rate of that. And there's no immunity to it at all. It's a brand new virus. And this is not like SARS because fever checkpoints can't catch it. And so something's got to be done. If it was you or me or our best buddy, they would say, okay, well, let's make sure to cut all the red tape we possibly can to find any crazy perverse incentives in bureaucracy that are preventing proper things from being done. And let's make sure, what are we doing to make sure that the hospitals have all the masks they need? What are we doing to make sure that companies are being incentivized to, how about this? If you make plastic gowns, no income taxes next year. Mm -hmm. Every corporation in America, go ahead. What can we do to incentivize them to go to work making the things that the people and the and the doctors and nurses need to do their jobs. What are we doing as far as testing? The CDC and the FDA are claiming a monopoly on the right to make a test. Okay, whoever says that, we're going to take them out back and shoot them in the head. <laughs> and then we're going to bring in new people to run the FDA and the CDC who do not have rules like that. And we'll, that'll be a real good example. And then we'll make it clear that you know what? You better, all you companies out there, don't make your masks out of asbestos, please. But otherwise, go for it, man. Do your worst. The, the worst mask you can make that, that covers your mouth and nose and has a rubber band is better than nothing by a lot. You know, you got this kind of plastic that you can make a gown out of, but it's not the exact regulation plastic. Well, we got nurses in New York wearing hefty bags right now. Is that within the regulations? That's just the best that they can do. And so, you know, under not a libertarian, but just any reasonable person run government, things could have been run way better than this. And there are examples in history where, you know, good leadership at the top was sent down the chain. And we all know as libertarians, all the perverse incentives in government bureaucracies. But you know, here was one where in the year 2000, they were really afraid that Al Qaeda was going to do an attack at the millennium. And so Al Gore had come in and he was the vice president, but he had, I guess, taken over. I forget the anecdote exactly now, but something like he had taken over a meeting of the deputies committee where it's like, oh, no, the vice president is here. That doesn't usually happen. And he said, listen, you know, customs, FBI, whoever, all you guys, write new memos, send them out to all your people, shake the trees as much as you can and let people know we are really worried about Muslim, Arab terrorism, Al-Qaeda terrorism in this country at the millennium. Keep your scanners peeled, everybody. And then what happened was a Border Patrol officer who had gotten the memo was at the border of Washington and British Columbia and said to this Arab, hey, you're pretty sweaty on a cold day. Why don't you step out of the car and show me what's in your trunk, young man? And blam, he's got a map to LAX and explosives. He's on his way to go bomb LAX. And they busted his ass. And he was a real ass Al-Qaeda terrorist. They tied him, if I remember it right, they tied him directly to, you know, known Al-Qaeda operatives. He wasn't just an Arab terrorist. He was tied to the Bin Ladenites. And it was the message had gotten through. 
that, hey, this is really important. Please get your act together. And it made a difference. And, you know, I think that Trump absolutely bears some blame for this. You know, you can go back and look. Reason Magazine has written this up. And I hate to cite the Times, but it's true. The New York Times had a write up of here's Trump's early statements about COVID. And he just routinely not just played it down, but spun it as it's all a baseless attack against him. No, he never said the virus was a hoax. Um, that's something that's been quoted out of context. But it's one of a hundred quote or one of a dozen quotes that are really bad. Oh, don't worry. This whole thing is going to go away by April. Miraculously, viruses disappear in April. Everybody knows that because it gets warmer. And but meanwhile, this is a novel virus. We, he doesn't know that. He didn't know that. And then his next tweet is the market's doing great. Good old market. Come on, bubble. Don't pop on me now. You know, and just that is how stupid and selfish the guy is. And frankly, look, and and I call dibs in front of anyone listening to this. I hate Hillary Clinton more than any of you combined <laughs> and always have. And at least since they burnt Waco and nobody can kind of pull that thing on me. This is not a partisan thing. You know, I, I hate Bill Clinton and George Bush more than Obama and Trump. It's not, um, it's not partisan. Okay. And I put Hillary in there with Bush and Bill. Um, but, um, so I, I don't, for some reason, I don't hate Trump quite as bad as George W. Bush or Bill Clinton. But at the same time, like, are we going to sit here and lie to ourselves that this guy is anybody than who we've always known he was? I've known who Donald Trump was since like 1983 when I saw him on Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous with his Ferrari and his fake tits girlfriend and his, you know, he was the definition of, you know, greedy, selfish, Reaganite yuppie. And I celebrated when he went bankrupt in the 90s. And I remember being outraged when I found out that he got such sweetheart deals that all of a sudden he was back in the skyscraper business after going bankrupt. How do you do that? Now he's all of a sudden he's a billionaire after having nothing? That doesn't seem right. Now, I never confused him with the bankers or the arms dealers or big agribusiness or big pharmaceutical companies. He was just a, a real estate tycoon and a... Um, you know, a TV guy. So he was rich, but he was never really one of them. I never confused him for that. But in his character, is he anything different than what we've all known him to be our whole lives? Of course not. And um, yeah, it turns out that having a guy like that in a crisis like this is not a very good thing. Sorry if for such a long answer, but I just, it really bothers the hell out of me, the things he's saying, even, even just where last week, it's trying to spin all of this crisis like it's not really a crisis. At the same time, he's saying a couple hundred thousand people might die. He's saying it's all a plot by the mainstream media to make him look bad. <laughs> well, huh? Can you get his his tweet hand and his mouth on the same page here? Does any of the language that's being put out there, whether it be shelter in place or just the constant stay at home or else type stuff, does any of that harken back to the language surrounding the war on terror to you after, especially after 9-11 happened? Sure. And I think the shelter in place, the first time I heard that was from the Boston terrorist attack. Um, and Zarnay of attack at the Boston Marathon. Um, I'm not sure if I'd heard that before then, but yes, I, it is all kind of coming out of, you know, orange alert and yes. all of these things. A friend wrote me this morning. He said, virus, viral pandemics are the health of the state. <laughs> just yeah. like war yes randolph Bourne said right and yes they'll take every advantage and then of course because just like with the mask thing because they're so dishonest and because they work so hard to take every advantage then you have people who just don't believe in the reality of the crisis at all right and um unfortunately is checking my twitter mentions and there are doctors you know never mind what the government you know experts pronounce there are doctors who are writing constantly for the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and under their own name on Twitter and talking about the absolute terror, the crisis that they are in. They're already overwhelmed. They're already, they got two ventilators left and they don't know when more are coming. And they got doctors and nurses who are falling sick and dying of this stuff. And they don't have proper masks. They don't have proper gowns. And they're really, really worried. 
And then the response I get is, no, that's all fake news because CBS aired a 10 second clip of an Italian hospital room, which, you know what? The obvious explanation for that is someone working the board used the wrong image accidentally. You know, you can presume if you want that, oh, yeah, no, that's because they they just can't find a crisis anywhere in New York to show you. And so they have to lie and show you a room from Italy. But that just doesn't hold up. You look at all the other information coming out of New York. You know, the New York Times ran a thing by a doctor who said, I expect to be fired for this, but I have to show you. Here's our emergency room. Here are all the people. Here are the four ventilators we got left. Here's all what's going on. And she goes on and on and explains that they do not have what they need. They're wearing the same gown and the same mask from patient to patient to patient to patient. They're probably spreading it themselves among people who might not even have it. You don't have to go to Italy for some fake footage for that. But just because CBS, let's say it was on purpose. It wasn't a mistake by some staffer, by some intern, but it was a deliberate plot by the Illuminati to make you afraid of, of what's going on in New York. Then that means what? That there's no such thing as the virus or it just there's no way that it's more harmful than the flu and that every doctor writing every article and every tweet about the chaos in their hospitals. It's all just all the Iranians dropping dead and all the Spaniards. It's all just a plot to make Trump look bad. Is that it? It's all fake news. But people just want to believe whatever they want to believe. So government oversteps once and then people don't believe another word about the crisis itself, even if it's not coming from the government. Right. I, I never recommend people should believe the government and what they say, but if you do a little bit of reading, you'll find that there's a hell of a lot more information coming out other than what Dr. Fauci says from the podium. You know, you're not supposed to believe anybody. You're supposed to do the best you can to know the facts based on as many credible sources of information that you can integrate as you can. Same with anything else. You know, I'm not a doctor, but you know what? I got a family member who's a nurse and one of her best friends is the epidemiologist at the hospital here in Austin. And he's been worried about where this is going for six and eight weeks now. You know, going back to the end of January, beginning of February, they could see this coming. They know that they don't have enough beds, or at least they're very worried that they don't have enough beds and equipment. They know there's going to be a peak here and that it's going to be ugly as hell. You know, even with the flu, people have some immunity to it. You've had the flu enough times in your life that it'll still get you sick, but it'll very rarely kill you. Well, this just isn't like that. And, you know, that's not a government official pronouncing something because of their hidden agenda to take your freedom away. You know, that's my, my sister, the nurse, her doctor friend, who is an epidemiologist, not just a doctor, who's an expert in the spreading of germs. And so uh, you can't make that stuff up any more than you could, <laughs> in the other sense of that phrase, any more than you could make up the failures of government here. In fact, I'll tell you one more thing about my sister here. She's not really an ideological type at all, politically speaking. Um, and when she told me this, it was no you know, reaffirmation of her politics. And it wasn't meant to be like an admission that, geez, I guess you're right about this stuff, little brother, either. Um, she was just observing that the government has failed on every level here. And the only people who are coming through are private businesses and private actors who are doing whatever they can. And the hospitals now are just blatantly breaking the rules. Anybody who can make masks of any decent quality and bring them to us, we will wear them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, because regular people in the community are stepping up. Because, and obviously what a mistake it was to rely on the state or the federal governments to be in charge of anything like this. You know, people want to complain about your store shelves being temporarily yeah. empty. Like this is a massive failure of capitalism. Right. But, um, you know, it's the capitalists who continually restock those shelves. It's the command. It's the people in charge at the top who 
don't have a real bottom line and so don't know how to make the right calls and continue to make the wrong calls. Yeah, I saw. In fact, I, it was hyperbolic when I said the head of the FDA and the CDC uh, should be taken out and shot. That was a reference to the way they do business in China. And, and why is that? It's because there's no other real accountability. Their whole economy is such a rigged game. You could be the worst fraudster, murderer, and never face any kind of real comeuppance. You never lose your job over it. And so they take them out back and shoot them. Uh, even CEOs of major corporations, because it's the only way to, you know, to to demonstrate accountability. There's nothing, there's no gray area. It's either no accountability at all or up against the wall. And that's how it is in this country too, with these bureaucracies. The Surgeon General who's been telling everyone not to wear masks, but now is telling everyone wear a mask, even if you got to wear a handkerchief, do that. Yeah. Well, what should happen to him? for being wrong about this for six weeks. Nothing. He's not even fired. The head of the FDA who continues to make sure that it's a crime for companies to make masks and sell them on the market. The CDC who at least spent weeks and weeks and weeks doing everything they could to prevent medical companies from coming up with effective tests for this disease. Not only do they not get taken out and shot, there's no accountability for them at all. And then they're the same ones who get to decide what to do from now on, too. Yeah, one of these interesting, bizarre twists takes on this I saw was someone wrote, after all of this, what we've really seen now is that this privatized healthcare system in America needs to be thrown away. And I thought, that's that's opposite of what this is. Is there an maybe a silver lining for libertarianism in this in this moment because i've also seen uh there's no libertarians during a pandemic you know akin to the no atheists in a foxhole line mm. well i mean and that's just not true and there have been um some really great libertarian journalists who've been keeping track especially at reason magazine and other places or you know counting all the ways that government has failed here um, but, you know, we ran an article at the Libertarian Institute last week by Per Byland. Yeah. People aren't familiar. He writes for the Mises Institute. In fact, I think he's a fellow at the Ludwig von Mises Institute. So don't get this twisted. This is as free market as a human can be. And he comes out and takes essentially the same position as Sheldon Richmond that we should abandon the term capitalism. And the reason why is, you know, to us libertarians who understand on one level what that means is – a system of, uh, you know, voluntary exchange based on property rights by private owners. Instead of the government owning the means of production, private property owners do, and then they trade that for money and this, that, the thing. But you know what? It has an entirely other definition too, which is rule by capitalists, right? Capitalism means a system of state power. And how, to, how do capitalists rule America? Well, for the last 230 years, they've insisted on a rigged market. The first thing they did when they created the Constitution was to create a central bank and take us to war. And they've been bailing out the rich at the expense of the poor and working and middle class people through the whole history of this country. Then about 120 years ago, at the dawn of the 20th century, the people said, look, if the rich are going to be on the dole, then we get some too. How about that? And then that was the compromise that was made was, you know, the bare minimum of a welfare state for regular people, which I see as essentially, you know, a counterproductive force, a bribe to make people ignore the real welfare cheats at the very top. Look at what happened last week when Congress passed this law. Each of us get $1,200 so that we don't overthrow the government that just printed a trillion, well, quote unquote, printed a trillion dollars out of thin air to buy up the bad debts of their cronies. Never even mind the bill that Congress passed giving them hundreds of billions of dollars. You know, Thomas Massey pointed out, it, if, you t if you sum up all of the $1,200 checks going out to the American people, that's $300 billion. Well, why do you have to pass a $2 trillion bill for that? 
the rest of that money is all going to the rich, but, and the, you know, the, the corporate elite and the bankers. And yet that's not even it. The fed created is, has been creating, according to David Stockman's writings, approximately a hundred billion dollars a day of new money that they use to bail out the rich. And so anyone on the left looks at this system as correctly as the most corrupt system on the face of the planet. You know, our government says that Iraq and Afghanistan have the two most corrupt governments in the world. Well, that's funny. What do they have in common? Uh Uh-huh. And then, but how's that supposed to compare to the government that created them? When our government's budget on a normal year is $4 trillion, four and a half. It's a rigged game for the very richest people. Our healthcare system is completely corrupt from the very top down and in every single way. I start with the pharmaceutical companies who have this magic power, this state power called the patent where they hire the government to hold a gun to the head of any of their competitors who would dare to compete with new medicines that they create. And what's natural about that? What's the free market about that? Nothing. And in fact, you know, Stefan Kinsella and some of these other libertarian experts in uh, intellectual property have pointed out, well, you can't patent clothing. You can't patent fashion. And you can't patent construction techniques and and architecture. Well, why is that? I guess because some judges decided that, uh, well, in architecture, it's a matter of safety, right? If if you come up with a better technique to build a building, you can't hoard that. You can't keep other people from copying that when you're talking about holding stories on top of each other without falling down in a storm. So, okay, but that's pretty arbitrary, right? And then in fashion, what's that? To me, that just sounds like the judges didn't want to have to sit there and count buttons, right? And decide these things. So they just said there is no copyright in fashion. Well, does that mean that clothing companies don't innovate because they won't be able to have this artificial monopoly on their innovation? No, it doesn't mean that. It means they innovate at breakneck speed constantly in cutthroat competition with each other. And the people are the ones who benefit. I mean, assuming you care what clothes look like and whatever. (laughs) But anyway, Um, So that just goes to show that there's nothing necessary, there's nothing natural to presume that we should have a patent system in medicine at all. In fact, you probably look at all of the smack that the media is talking against using the malaria drugs here, the methylchloroquine, um, which is its patents expired 50 years ago or something. Is that just a coincidence that they don't want doctors experimenting with treating COVID patients with this stuff when it's an anti-inflammatory? It's, you know, my my wife has lupus. She's been on this before because when you have an immune system storm, a lot of the people who are suffocating and dying, it's not the COVID pneumonia. It's the immune system overreaction pneumonia that's killing them. The cyclostorm, cyclo, I don't know how to pronounce it, storm that it causes. And then, so this medicine can help to stop that. It, it shuts that immune overreaction down. And so we even know why it works and they're still playing it down because it doesn't have a patent. That's why, because there's some corrupt crony capitalist who, and by the way, who sponsors all the biggest TV news stations? I dare you to watch the nightly news tonight. Every single ad on there is from these major drug companies and they would rather you die than for anyone to be able to treat you with a cheap pill when they want to figure out a way to treat you expensively on a patent with protection. And so then you go to the hospital companies who pass all these certificate of need laws. Mm -hmm. Isn't that funny? They're called the con laws. That's just a coincidence, you understand. And that means that it's illegal to compete with your local hospital. And let's say that you and I had both uh, inherited a billion dollars from our dads and we said, this is a crisis. Let's go into business. Let's make a new hospital in Austin. We hear they need beds. Well, we would go to jail if we tried it. We wouldn't even be able to try it because it's against the law because every hospital company in America is a corrupt crony capitalist system. And they lobby, not every single state in the union, but like 35 out of 50 have these laws where the government of your state 
will decide whether or not you can build a hospital here or whether you can build a hospital there. And that's why the number of beds is artificially low right now to the nth degree. And then, of course, uh, the and the hospital companies are huge corporations. And so if they have that state power available to them, they will use it, of course, just like any other business would. And and then it's the insurance companies have the worst cartel in the world on the way they do business. And even you look at the invention of the HMO and the PPO and this, that, and the other thing, all of that was done by Congress. That's not the free market talking. It never was. Health uh, in, uh, employer provided health insurance. That was an invention of the pharmaceutical, I mean, the, the insurance companies in cahoots with the Congress that created that. And then even Obamacare, which was supposedly this big, you know, socialist intervention on behalf of the little guy against the corporate elite, that entire bill was written by the insurance companies. And in fact, famously, one of the lobbyists who helped write it, I forgot if he was tweeting this in public or just somebody had found his email where he was just bragging and boasting and laughing about how stupid the American people are, that they just tell us whatever they want. If you like your doctor, you can keep it and whatever to get people to go along with it when it's just a heist at gunpoint. It's the federal government. It's the insurance companies using the power of the federal government to prevent competition in the open market for their services. And so when a liberal or a leftist looks at our current medical system, what do they see? It's a crisis and catastrophe everywhere. And and they can easily anticipate that the 10 million people who just lost their jobs are now going to be completely desperate for losing their health insurance. And so if you are, you know, born leaning left, then you are having your bias confirmed big time. And it's up to us libertarians to explain that everything you hate about our corporate fascist system, that is what it is. You know, Robert Higgs, the very best one of us, Robert Higgs says it's participatory fascism. We don't have Mussolini. We don't have brown shirts on the streets going around beating people up and this kind of terror. Well, I don't know. It depends on what neighborhood you live in. But it's not the classic fascism of the imagination that people knee jerk against. And yes, it's true that liberals and leftists call everything fascism when they don't know what the hell they're talking about. But that is what it is. It's state capitalism to the nth degree, right? It is crony capitalism to the nth degree. And the opposite of that is not socialism. The opposite of that is a free market. But how do you get there from here? <laughs> you know, it, it, it seems almost impossible. And um, but so that's the discrepancy that has to be made. Capitalism, as Per Bilan says, it means two totally different things. On one hand, it means an economic system where the means of production are owned by property owners. On the other hand, it means what we have now, a system of state power, which is a completely corrupt and distorted market. I mean, think where we began this. They've blown almost $7 trillion on empire in this century alone so far. That's just the cost of the wars. You can add approximately a trillion a year just in the base cost of the care and feeding of this military force. So $27 trillion blown on militarism. That's in, it's impossible to imagine how much wealth that is. Blown on militarism in this century. And it did not have to be. And that's just in this century. That's just since W. Bush. Never mind his father and Bill Clinton in the end of the Cold War. And so, um, you know, it's easy to see why anybody looking at that would think, well, I guess if the opposite of that is socialism, count me in yeah. on that side. And so it's our responsibility to let people know that that would be the bad choice. That's getting scared and run off in the wrong direction when what we need now is more freedom than ever, especially in the marketplace. And then I'm sorry, because I guess you were asking about all the totalitarian measures, keeping people home and breaking up churches, meetings and this kind of thing. Um, I think some of that is necessary in this emergency, but I don't know how what and I hate it that they're the ones making the call. I would rather see every important person in society do the right thing and use their bully pulpit to encourage people to just stay home if they possibly can to prevent this thing from spreading, to prevent it from having it where so many people are sick at any one time that the hospitals are having to triage patients to die in the hallways and parking lots. We just can't have that. And, and um, 
But that's the situation that our government has put us in. And um, now they're locking people down probably beyond reason and setting precedents for erosions of our freedom that, yes, we're going to have to live with in the future. And that, yes, as libertarians especially, we should be doing every single thing we can to prepare, to fight, to roll back. And and to use this as an example, right? It, it, it There is, just as Condoleezza Rice and Rahm Emanuel agree, you never mm-hmm. let a crisis go to waste. Well, we don't have to lie. We don't have to exploit. We don't have to represent some interest group trying to get over on anyone else. We're just promoting freedom. That's what our libertarian movement is, promoting natural individual human rights for all men and women. And and the way to do that is to just keep telling the truth and explaining how it was that government has screwed us up and made things so much harder for everyone to deal with in this crisis and to propose ways that voluntary society can do much better next time by refusing to rely on them and making our own preparations uh, to take care of ourselves. Well said, well said. And uh, I know we got to get you out of here. You're a busy guy. Um, plug away real quick uh, for those listening. Um, what you got? I know you got a new book coming out, but talk about the Institute and everything. Sure. So I'm the founder and the director of the Libertarian Institute, and that's Sheldon Richmond and Pete Quinones, Kyle Anselone, and a bunch of other great writers for you there. It's libertarianinstitute.org. And I'm the editorial director of antiwar.com at antiwar.com. And, um, you know, there's uh, the great Jason Ditz and Eric Garris and Dave DeCamp and all of our great writers and and everything in the world that we've got going on for you there. Everyone, you got to be reading antiwar.com every day. If I drop dead tomorrow of the COVID, you got to read antiwar.com every day. It's the most important project on the internet. And then, uh, and I'm very proud to be associated with it. And then I wrote the book Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan. And on the ho- which is now half price, by the way, on Amazon.com. I lowered the price on the Kindle and the paperback there for you. And I'm the host of Anti-War Radio on KPFK 90.7 FM in Los Angeles on Sunday mornings and the Scott Horton Show podcast at scotthorton.org. And I've got more than 5,000 interviews for you going back to 2003 there at scotthorton.org. Thank you so much, Scott. Thanks again for being here and uh, good luck I'm hunkering down through all of this stuff. Yeah, you too, man. And thank you very much for having me, Buck. Good to talk to you. All right. I hope you guys enjoyed that chat with the great Scott Horton. He's good. He's always so good and uh, such a cool guy too. He's got a very punk rock uh, ethos and I like that about him. Anyway, as you guys know, you can find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash death to tyrants podcast. Find me on Twitter, Buck Rebel, B-U-C-K-R-E-B-E-L. Hey, by the way, I got some new shirts, uh, death to tyrants podcast shirts. You can see those on the Facebook page and uh, hit me up through there if you'd like to order one. I've got a few left, so let me know. Anyway, stay safe during this bizarre, bizarre time and uh, be nice to people. I'll see you guys later. You get split in fucking half, cause I call them the hologram wrath. But I am the center inside the placenta of math. You clash with cyanide gas and die fast. Rhythmical equivalent of solids, liquid, and gas. We smash your science with the power of Lord Titus. But I am the virus inside of the iris of Cyrus. Like the sound of the Death to Tyrants podcast? Our audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.